Uh, hi, my name is Liz Klimek. I am a graduate student at New Mexico State University. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, um, many of who are here in the room today. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is basically a status update on what is basically a work in progress, very much so, um, aimed at addressing this question. Um, what is the relationship between processes in the disk of galaxies and in the CGM? So in the disk, there are processes, as we all know, such as star formation and feedback um, due to various sources. Um, and in the circumgalactic medium, there's a lot of activity. We've got a lot of traffic inflow and outflow of gas due to accretion and outflow. We've got ramp pressure and tidal stripping. Um, and in observations, um, uh, observations have observed uh, the cause and effect relationship between star formation in the disk and gas mass in the CGM. For example, the work of the absorption line, work of Steidel um, et al. So on the theory side, we would like to also study um, this question by looking at the mass flow um, of materials through the CGM in high redshift galaxies using galaxies simulated with the ART code. Um, so the ART code's already been described, but in brief, it's a hydrodynamic AMR code. Um, it's got high resolution, 30 to 70 parsec in a cosmological setting. And what we um, have, are, used in, are using in this study is basically a Milky Way progenitor between redshifts two and four. Um, and uh, for reference, I've got the masses up there. There is thermal feedback um, in this model due to supernovae, types one and two, and stellar winds, and there's no AGN. Um, so what we did is we took our Milky Way progenitors and we needed to define, clearly define the two components. So we separated out a disk component um, by defining a central cylindrical region that uh, represented the ISM of the disk. And then everything out to two real radii beyond this disk was taken to be part of the CGM. Then we calculated the star formation rate in the disk, and then calculated the mass accretion rate basically through shells, through the halo, um, spherical symmetric shells through the halo, to um, look at the relationship between the star formation rate in the disk and inflow and outflow in the halo. And then we split our gas into uh, different temperature ranges um, that are roughly representative of um, the phases of gas probed by different ionic species and absorption line studies like magnesium-2 and silicon and carbon-4. So um, the mass flux idea was inspired by the work of Young et al. Um, who looked at the gas accretion um, through spherical shells in the halo of a simulated Milky Way mass galaxy at a single snapshot in time, basically redshift zero. And just as, just as an example, um, they looked at uh, m dot as a function of radius for all gas in different temperature bins and then gas in different metallicity bins. Um, and the mass accretion rate was calculated using this equation, um, which is only looking at the radial um, component of inflow and outflow. So expanding on this idea, we want to know, um, um, we want to look at not just one snapshot in, snapshot in time, but look at a time evolution um, on a sequence of snapshots at high redshift. So what I'm gonna show you is um, um, a sequence of plots that has a lot of stuff on it. So um, to let you know what you're looking at, on the top panel, um, the black line is going to represent dark matter. The blue line represents stars. In the middle panel, um, there's the gas in the CGM separated out into temperature bins. Um, red is the hottest bin at uh, above 10 to the 6. Then um, the uh, orangish yellow line is 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 and then green is 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5, and then everything below 10 to the 4 is in blue. And at the bottom, we have star formation rate is calculated in the cylindrical disk region, um, and the red dot it shows you where we are at each snapshot. So this bottom plot's gonna look the same in 
in the following sequence I'm going to show you, but the red dot's going to march along through time. And then we also separated out the components into inflow and outflow and considered them separately. So positive, um, everything that's positive represents, um, actually, that's backwards. So everything that's positive is out and everything that's negative is inflow. So, okay. um, let's see if this runs. So, as we step along through time, you can see these structures on these uh, satellites coming in towards the disk. And we've already marched through time. So let me step us through one at a time here real quick. So you can see um, substructure coming in. You can see whether or not there is gas associated with them. Um, you can see, for example, in this uh, in this situation, um, the gas is starting to get stripped and disperse. Um, here's the halo coming in. And right down here, we've got this guy getting closer and closer to the disk. And then, it, when, within the next time step, it presumably hits the disk and goes through. And then we get a burst in the star formation rate. And subsequently, if you look at the gas, then you can see that we've got this nice hot outflow component. So I'm going to skip to the end of this sequence real quick. So now I'm just going to focus on what happens right before, during, and after this um, interesting event. So as I pointed out, we have, we saw this, uh, this guy falling in, the satellite falling in, and then interacted with the disk, and we have this hot outflowing material. So somehow a starburst event got triggered in that cylindrical disk region, and, um, and this very hot gas came out. But what's interesting is what you see is only hot gas coming out um, and not really anything in coming out in any other temperature ranges. Um, what's also interesting is this, this wind here doesn't really affect any of the accretion, any of the smooth accretion or any of the incoming, other incoming satellites. So if I step one more time step, you can see that that wind has traveled out and some material behind it has cooled. Um, so initially, when it was about uh, 0.4 virial radii, it was traveling at about 400 kilometers per second. And by the time it gets way out here, it's traveling at 130 kilometers per second. So it is losing energy and slowing down. And it's just still not um, affecting any of the inflow. So it's like the wind just went poof and then just went through everything. So what can we? Uh, learn from this. So, this first of all, our star formation rate, we did check them against the predictions of Beruzzi, and they are consistent at redshift 2. They're a little bit high at redshift 4. Um, the wind is composed entirely of hot gas. There's no cool gas seen, but that's interesting because in um, the work of Steidel et al. in the absorption line studies, we see low ionization absorption due to magnesium, silicon, carbon-4, um, which tells us that there have to be outflows of cool gas. Um, and we're not seeing that in this particular model. Um, the wind speeds are consistent with previous um, work, uh, Steidel, uh, Lyman break galaxies, and Severino and Klippen. And the wind does achieve um, escape velocity. It, it's greater than the escape velocity, so it will, I mean, it definitely leaves the halo. Um, the outflow rate is greater than or equal to the star formation rate, which um, is consistent with Patini and Stidel. Um So what our model did not have was radiation pressure, which should um, presumably reduce the amount of hot gas or increase the amount of cool gas that, that gets thrown out. Um, so, like I said, this is uh, still a work in progress. Um, what, what this method tells us is that if we look at the time evolution of the mass accretion rate of the gas, it enables us um, to track and quantify the flow of gas through the CGM with it using an AMR code. 
Um, and then if we look at the mass accretion rate of the dark matter in the stars, we can identify those satellites and track them as they're coming in and then hopefully be able to see, you know, was there a merging event um, that triggered some sort of outflow or what happened to that satellite. Um, some, of the, some of those um, uh, snapshots that I showed, you could see that the gas was getting stripped um, and dissipating. Um, so we see a cause and effect relationship where we saw something hit the disk and then there was an outflow. Um, so that was clear, however, we can't really discern exactly what triggered that outflow. We just know an outflow happened in that cylindrical region. So a hot low density wind erupted and transported gas to two virial ra radii within 140 million years um, and did not disrupt any of the infalling uh, material, which is, is a question that a lot of people have on their mind. So what we need to do next is we need to um, look at quantifying uh, things like the gas fractions. So the gas fractions and the stellar fractions of, of material coming in, especially right before that star formation event, and um, look at the gas and stellar mass lost and gained by the disk and the incoming satellites. And then um, what we also haven't done yet is look at the, metal, look at the metallicity, um, different metallicity cuts to see what that tells us. And then we will also compare um, our model to one with radiation pressure to see how that changes the outflow. So that's it. Thank you. All right, we have time for some questions. Yeah, that's something I still need to calculate because I don't know how much gets consumed, how much gets deposited in the disk, how much gets stripped. So I'm going to try to tease that out and quantify that. Yeah. Um, the, the outflow of the, the yeah, dark the matter plot. That black line is dark matter, yeah. Yes. So you're talking about the peaks or just the, like the envelope in general? Just the envelope as a whole, yeah. Oh, so what we're kind of catching here is just basically just the, the bulk motion, like the orbital motion of the, of the dark matter. So really with the dark matter plots, what's important is these peaks because they show the satellites, but the, the envelope's just reflecting just the orbital motion of the, of the dark matter. That's all it tells you. Clear questions. All right, well, let's thank the speaker again.